Hi everyone, it's Professor Primson. In this video, we're going to talk about solving polynomial and rational inequalities. So in this section, we're going to solve polynomial and rational inequalities, which will be solved using factoring and the most previously established guidelines when graphing a polynomial or rational function that we talked about in previous videos. So in this video, we're going to talk about solving polynomial and rational inequalities. So let's start with polynomial inequalities. An important consequence of the intermediate value theorem is that the values of the polynomial function p of x do not change sign between successive zeros. What that means is that the values of the polynomial function p of x between successive zeros are either all positive or they're all negative. That means if you have successive x-intercepts, the graph of the function p of x is entirely above the x-axis or entirely below the x-axis. And so this property about polynomial functions allows us to solve polynomial inequalities like this, where you have a polynomial function on one side of the inequality. The inequality could be greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, and on the right side, the inequality will be zero because we want to compare this polynomial function, whether its y values are above the x-axis, so that means the y values are greater than zero, or if the polynomial function is below the x-axis and the y values are less than zero. So finding the real zeros of the polynomial function is going to be very important, and then we're going to use test values like we did with the sign chart or number line between successive real zeros to determine the intervals that satisfy the inequality. So the guidelines for solving polynomial inequalities. So step one, we're going to rewrite the inequality so that all the non-zero terms appear on one side of the inequality symbol and that the other side of the inequality symbol will be zero. Step two, we're going to factor the polynomial expression into irreducible factors. So you'll either have linear factors or irreducible quadratic factors and find all the real zeros. Step three, list all the intervals that are determined by the real zeros. So that's the sign chart or number line. Step four, use test values to make a table or a diagram of the signs of each factor in each interval. And in the last row of the table, determine the sign of the polynomial on that interval. And then step five, determine the solutions of the inequality from the last row of the table. Be sure to check whether the endpoints of these intervals satisfies the inequality. And this may happen if the inequality involves greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. So in terms of a graph, this is what's happening. Let's say you have a polynomial function p of x, which is equal to four is the greatest common factor that's been factored out already from all the terms. Then you have a factor of x subtract two, a factor of x plus one, x subtract 0.5, and the factor x plus two. Well, notice that the real zeros of this polynomial function are x equals two, x equals negative one, x equals positive 0.5, and x equals negative two. So notice that those are corresponding to the graph where you have x-intercepts. You have an x-intercept at negative two comma zero, negative one comma zero, 0.5 comma 0 and then also 2 comma 0. So what we've done in previous videos is that we find out the polynomial function is equal to 0. That tells us the real zeros of the polynomial function. So you set the entire polynomial function equal to 0. You find out your real zeros and those are corresponding to x-intercepts. Well, notice that this actually divides the number line or the x-axis up into sub-intervals. You have x values that are less than negative 2, x values between negative 2 and negative 1, between negative 1 and positive 0.5, between 0.5 and positive 2, and then on the right side of x equals 2. So in other words, we're going to find out, is the graph above the x-axis or below the x-axis on each of those subintervals that are formed by the real zeros of the polynomial function? Example 1, solving polynomial inequalities. Solve each of the following polynomial inequalities using the algebraic method involving either a sign chart or number line. So number 1, we're going to solve this polynomial inequality. x cubed subtract 2x squared on the left side of the inequality is greater than the right side of the inequality is 3x. So the first step is to make sure that all the terms are on one side of the inequality, so the other side of the inequality is zero. So let's take x cubed minus 2x squared is greater than 3x. Let's subtract 3x to the left side of the inequality, so the right side will be zero. So x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x is greater than zero. And now notice that you want to factor the polynomial function on the left side of the inequality. So all three terms have an x in common. Factor it out as the greatest common factor. And then let's see what's left over. You factor out an x from each term. You'll have an x squared from the first term left over, a minus 2x from the second term, and a minus 3 from the third term. Well, this is a trinomial. Let's see if we factors even further. Find two numbers that multiply to negative 3, and the same two numbers need to add to negative 2. Well, the factors that work are negative 3 and positive 1. So now we know how it factors. It will be an x is the greatest common factor, an x minus 3 is a factor, an x plus 1 is a factor, and the inequality is greater than 0. So since the polynomial is on the left side and the right side is 0, we're trying to find out what are the x values where the polynomial function is above the x-axis. So let's find the real zeros of the polynomial function. So we can start setting up our number line or sign chart. So the real zeros of the polynomial function occur when the polynomial function is equal to zero. So you'll have x times x minus three times x plus one set equal to zero, and you'll have x equals zero, x equals positive three, and x equals negative one as your real zeros for the polynomial function. And so now let's make a sign chart. 
So negative 1, 0, and 3 will go on the sign chart. So x equals negative 1, x equals 0, and x equals 3 are the real zeros, which will correspond to x-intercepts on the graph of the polynomial function. Notice that this divides the number line up into four different regions. x values that are less than negative 1, x values between negative 1 and 0, x values between 0 and 3, and x values that are greater than 3. So now let's choose test values as the next step. So let's choose an x equals negative 2 on the left side of negative 1, x equals negative a half between negative 1 and 0, x equals positive 1 between 0 and 3, and x equals 4. So let's choose that one so it's on the right side of x equals 3. So now these test values go into the polynomial function to find out what is the y value of the polynomial function for each test value. So if you substitute negative 2 into the polynomial function, you'll get a y value of negative 12. That means on this portion of the graph of the polynomial function, you'll have the graph below the x-axis because the y value is negative. If you substitute an x equals negative a half into the polynomial function, you'll have y value of 7 eighths, that's positive 7 eighths. So now you're above the x-axis between x equals negative 1 and x equals 0. Whenever you substitute x equals 1 in, the y value is negative 4. So now you're below the x-axis between 0 and 3. And if x equals 4, the polynomial function is positive 20. So now you're back above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 3. Well, let's see what the solutions are for this polynomial inequality. We want to find out where are the y values for this polynomial function positive. Or, in other words, where is the graph above the x-axis? So it's above the x-axis between x equals negative 1 and x equals 0, and also above the x-axis whenever x is greater than 3. So now notice, this was a strict inequality. It's not or equal to 0, it was strictly greater than 0. So we're looking for what are the x values where the graph is strictly above the x-axis. So it would be negative 1 to 0 for the x values, and also 3 to infinity, with a union between them. That's what's called the solution set to the inequality. So any x value in this solution set would satisfy the polynomial inequality, x cubed minus 2x squared is greater than 3x. All right, let's try number two. This time we're going to take the polynomial inequality 2x cubed plus x squared plus 6 is greater than or equal to 13x. So again, the first step is to make sure that all the terms are on one side of the inequality symbol so that one side of the inequality is equal to zero. So you have 2x cubed plus x squared plus 6 is greater than or equal to 13x. Let's move the 13x to the left side of the inequality. So the right side of the inequality will be zero. So you have 2x cubed plus x squared, subtract 13x plus 6, that's greater than or equal to 0. So now notice that this has four terms, but it's not so easy to factor using grouping. So let's use the rational zeros theorem to see if we can find out what is one of the possible rational zeros for this polynomial function. So the rational zeros theorem said you have factors of the form p divided by q. p is a factor of the constant term, that's the numerator, and q, the denominator, is factors of the leading coefficient. Well, the constant term in this case, the polynomial function would be 6. So factors of 6 would give you plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and plus or minus 6. Whereas factors of the leading coefficient, the leading coefficient of the polynomial is 2. So you're trying to find out factors of 2, which are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. So all the possible rational zeros are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 6, and then also the fractions, plus or minus 1 half and plus or minus 3 halves. So these are all the possible rational zeros, or the real zeros, for the polynomial function p of x, which is the left side of this inequality. So if we call p of x 2x cubed plus x squared minus 13x plus 6, let's try out each of these rational zeros to see what is the remainder whenever you substitute in the real zero. Is the remainder zero or is it not? So if you plug in 2 into the polynomial function, you'll find out that it's 2 times 2 cubed plus 2 squared, subtract 13 times 2 plus 6, and that does give you zero. So in other words, the remainder is 0 whenever the polynomial function p of x is divided by x subtract 2, because we substitute in 2 into the polynomial function. And so now we want to find out what is the quotient polynomial, because now we know that x minus 2 is a factor. What is the other factor that's being multiplied by x minus 2 to give us p of x? So let's find out what that is using synthetic division. So 2, 1, negative 13, and 6 are the coefficients of p. That goes on the inside of the division bar. And 2 we know is a real 0. That will go on the outside, because we're going to divide by x subtract 2. And so now drop the leading coefficient 2, multiply, 2 times 2 gives you 4, add that column, 1 plus 4 gives you 5, 2 times 5 gives you 10, add the column, negative 13 plus 10 gives you negative 3, 2 times negative 3 gives you negative 6, and the last column when you add gives you 0, the remainder is 0, we already knew that, but the quotient polynomial is 2x squared plus 5x subtract 3. And so we have a way of factoring p of x. p of x is equal to x subtract 2 because we know the remainder is 0 whenever x equals 2 is substituted into the polynomial. And the other factor is 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Where is this polynomial function greater than or equal to 0? Well, let's see. This quotient polynomial does factor further. 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. If you factor using the AC method or trial and error, you find out that the factors are 2x minus 1 and also x plus 3. 
So we have the entire polynomial function factored. It's x subtract 2 is a factor, 2x minus 1 is a factor, and x plus 3 is a factor. So now we can find out the real zeros of this polynomial function. The polynomial function, the real zeros will be whenever p of x equals 0, which will be x equals 2, x equals positive half, and x equals negative 3. So now let's make a sign chart using these real zeros that we found. We have x equals negative 3, x equals a half, and x equals 2. This will divide the number line or the sign chart up into four different regions again. So you have x values on the left side of negative 3. We'll choose a test value of negative 4 for x values. You have x values between negative 3 and positive half. Let's choose x equals 0 as the test value. Between x equals a half and x equals 2, let's choose x equals 1. And on the right side of x equals 2, we'll choose x equals 3. These test values go into the polynomial function p of x which in our case was the polynomial function was 2x cubed plus x squared minus 13x plus 6, which was the left side of the inequality, which was greater than or equal to 0. So since the inequality is greater than or equal to 0, we're trying to find out where is the graph above or on the x-axis in this case, because you are including the possibility of the polynomial function equaling 0. And so let's plug these test values into our polynomial function to find out what is the sign of the y value, or the sign of the polynomial function, on that subinterval. So if you substitute x equals negative 4 into your polynomial function, the y value or the output will be negative 54. So you get a negative y value. That means you're below the x-axis on the left side of x equals negative 3. If you substitute in 0 into the polynomial function, the y value is positive 6. So now you're above the x-axis between x equals negative 3 and x equals a half. If you plug in x equals 1 into the polynomial function, the y value is negative 4. So now you're below the x-axis between x equals a half and x equals 2. And if you substitute in x equals 3 into the polynomial function, you get positive 30. That means you're above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 2. So let's solve the polynomial inequality by finding out where's the polynomial function, where are the y values for this polynomial function greater than 0, or that, may, that means above the x-axis, or equal to 0, which means on the x-axis. So we're looking for where is it above the x-axis, that's between x equals negative 3 and x equals a half, and also from 2 to infinity for the x values that are greater than 2. But we also need to include the x-intercepts. So our solution set to the inequality will be the x value negative 3 is included because that is an x-intercept, so that will be with a square bracket, comma, 1 half because that interval is where the graph is above the x-axis. Again, include 1 half with a square bracket because that is an x-intercept. That is a real zero for the polynomial function. Union, and then the other interval was 2. 2 again is included because 2 is a real zero. And then it also goes up to infinity. So the solution set would be square bracket negative 3 to 1 half, square bracket on 1 half as well union, square bracket on 2, comma, infinity. Infinity always gets in parentheses, or negative infinity also gets in parentheses. So that's the solution set to this polynomial inequality. Any x value that's in this interval would satisfy the inequality 2x cubed plus x squared plus 6 is greater than or equal to 13x. Now let's talk about rational inequalities. So unlike polynomial functions, rational functions are not necessarily continuous functions because they can contain vertical asymptotes and also holes in the graph. So what this means is that the graph will actually be broken up into separate branches. So when you solve a rational inequality like r of x is greater than or equal to 0, we're going to use test values between successive x-intercepts but also vertical asymptotes because we know that on either side of a vertical asymptote, the graph can change sign. You can be increasing without bound on one side of the vertical asymptote and the y values are decreasing without bound on the other side of the vertical asymptote or vice versa. So we're going to use the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes when we make a sign chart or number line to determine the intervals that satisfy the inequality. So the guidelines for solving a rational inequality. Step 1, write the inequality so that all the non-zero terms appear on one side of the inequality symbol so that the other side of the inequality is equal to zero, just like with polynomial inequalities. You want to make sure that all the terms are on one side so the other side of the inequality is zero. In addition, quotients must be written with a common denominator. In other words, you can't have several fractions involved. You need to have one common fraction with a common denominator. Step two, factor both the numerator and denominator of the rational expression on one side of the inequality symbol into irreducible factors. So this time, we're not going to have just a polynomial function to factor. We'll have a polynomial function in the numerator, the factor, and a polynomial function in the denominator, the factor, because a rational function is a quotient of two polynomial functions. So we'll factor into linear factors or irreducible quadratic factors and then find the what's called cut points, which are the x-intercepts, the real zeros, and also the vertical asymptotes for the rational function. Step three, list your intervals determined by the cut points, which is the number line or sign chart. Step four, use test values to make a table or a diagram of the signs of each factor in each interval. In the last row of the table, determine the sign of the rational function on that interval. 
and then step 5, determine the solutions of the inequality from the last row of the table, and to be sure to check whether the endpoints of these intervals satisfy the inequality. This may happen if you have an inequality, again, is greater than or equal to 0, or less than or equal to 0, because you want to include x-intercepts, or real zeros, as part of your answer if it's or equal to 0, but if it's a vertical asymptote, you cannot include it as a possible solution because those x values where there's a vertical asymptote do not give you output values. So example two, solving rational inequalities. Solve each of the following rational inequalities using the algebraic method that's just been described involving either a sign chart or number line. So number one, we're going to solve this rational inequality. 4x plus 5 divided by the quantity x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 3. So let's move the 3 to the left side of the inequality so that it's equal to 0 on one side of the inequality. So you have 4x plus 5 divided by x plus 2, subtract 3, and it's greater than or equal to now 0 on the right side of the inequality symbol. Now we have a little bit more work to do. Notice you have two terms. One's a fraction, and the other one can be made a fraction by putting 3 divided by 1. So you need to rewrite this so it has one common fraction with a common denominator. So the common denominator, the LCD, is x plus 2. So take 3 and rewrite this 3 divided by 1 as 3 times x plus 2 divided by x plus 2. And we'll keep the first fraction the same because the LCD was already x plus 2. And so the left side of the inequality will be 4x plus 5 divided by x plus 2, then subtract 3 times x plus 2 in the numerator divided by x plus 2, and that is greater than or equal to 0. So now you need to simplify these two fractions by subtracting the numerators because now you have a common denominator of x plus 2. So you have 4x plus 5, and then after you distribute the negative 3, you have negative 3x and also minus 6 in the numerator all divided by x plus 2, and this is greater than or equal to 0. And so if you simplify the numerator, you'll have 4x minus 3x, that's positive 1x, and 5 subtract 6 is negative 1. So the numerator becomes x minus 1, the LCD or common denominator is x plus 2, and it's greater than or equal to 0. So since the inequality is greater than or equal to 0, we're trying to find out where is the graph above the x-axis, because it's greater than 0, or where is it equal to 0, where is the graph on the x-axis. So we're going to look at the rational function x minus 1 divided by x plus 2. So let's call that lowercase r of x. x minus 1 divided by x plus 2, that's already in the lowest terms. So now we can find out what are the real zeros of this rational function, and also where are the vertical asymptotes for this rational function. So let's find out the real zeros first. r of x equals 0 means that the entire fraction x minus 1 divided by x plus 2 is equal to 0. Where is a fraction equal to 0? It's when the numerator is 0. So that means x minus 1 is equal to 0, which means that x equals 1. That is a real zero for the rational function r of x. So x equals 1 will go on the sign chart or number line. But we also need to consider where are the vertical asymptotes for this rational function's graph. So the rational function is undefined whenever the denominator is equal to 0. So x plus 2 is equal to 0 gives you x equals negative 2. And x equals negative 2 is what's called a vertical asymptote. Because the rational function was already in lowest terms, and that's the value that makes the denominator 0, x equals negative 2. So when we make a sign chart or number line, we'll include x equals 1 but also x equals negative 2 because the graph can change signs on either side of an x-intercept, but also change signs on either side of a vertical asymptote as well for a rational function. So our sign chart will include x equals negative 2. Notice that that's a dashed line because that's a vertical asymptote, but also x equals 1, and that is a real 0. So notice that this divides the number line or sign chart up into three different regions, x values less than negative 2, x values between negative 2 and positive 1, and x values greater than positive 1. So let's choose our test values x equals negative 3 on the left side of negative 2, x equals 0 between x equals negative 2 and x equals 1, and x equals 2 to be on the right side of x equals 1. These test values go into the rational function r of x, which was x attract 1 in the numerator and x plus 2 in the denominator. So if you substitute negative 3, the output value or the y value is 4. So on the left side of the vertical asymptote, x equals negative 2, you're above the x-axis. So whenever you plug in 0 into the rational function, the y value is negative a half. So the y value is negative. That means you're now below the x-axis on the right side of the vertical asymptote. So notice that the vertical asymptote, the graph does change sign. It was above the x-axis, and now it's below the x-axis on the other side of the vertical asymptote. So that's very important to include vertical asymptotes on your sign chart or number line. And now the last test value, whenever you substitute in 2 into the rational function, you'll get positive 1 fourth. So now you're back above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 1. So at x equals 1, you cross the x-axis. Because you are below the x-axis on the left side of x equals 1, and now you're above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 1. And so now we're ready to actually solve the rational inequality. We want to find out where is this rational inequality, x minus 1 divided by x plus 2, where is it greater than or equal to 0? So it's greater than 0 when it's above the x-axis. So you're above the x-axis 
from negative infinity to negative 2. You cannot include negative 2 because negative 2 is not part of the domain of that rational function. So it'll be negative infinity to negative 2, both with parentheses. Union, you're also above the x-axis from 1 to infinity. x equals 1, you do want to include because we were or equal to 0. And equals 0 is where the x value was equal to 1. So bracket on 1 to infinity. So negative infinity to negative 2, union, bracket on 1, comma, infinity. That's the solution set to this rational inequality. So any x value in this solution set would solve the inequality. 4x plus 5 in the numerator divided by x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 3. All right, let's try one more to finish up this video. Number 2, let's solve this rational inequality. x squared minus 4x plus 3 in the numerator. And the denominator is x squared minus 4x minus 5. Where is this rational function less than or equal to 0? So notice that the inequality is already 0 on one side of the inequality symbol. So we're already set up exactly like we want it to be. The left side, we want to factor both the numerator and denominator because we want to find out what makes the numerator 0 and what makes the denominator 0. Because 0 in the numerator means real zeros for the rational function, and zeros in the denominator means vertical asymptotes for the rational function. So let's factor the numerator. You have a trinomial. Find two numbers that multiply to 3, but also the same two numbers need to add to negative 4. So the factors are negative 3 and also negative 1. So x minus 3 is a factor, and x minus 1 is a factor of the numerator. Now the denominator also has three terms. You have x squared minus 4x minus 5. Find two numbers that multiply to negative 5, and the same two numbers need to add to negative 4. So the factors at work are negative 5 and positive 1 this time. So x minus 5 is a factor, and x plus 1 is a factor. So we factored the numerator and factored the denominator completely, and notice that there are no common factors in the numerator and denominator to cancel out or simplify. So we're going to find out where is this rational function on the left side less than or equal to 0. So if it's less than 0, it means where are the y values below the x-axis, or less than 0. Or if it's equal to 0, that means where is the graph for the rational function on the x-axis. So we're going to call our rational function, lowercase r of x, is x minus 3 times x minus 1 in the numerator, and the denominator will be x minus 5 times x plus 1. Make sure that the one side of the inequality must be equal to 0 before you label your rational function. And notice it has no common factors, so this is already in the lowest terms. So where is the rational function equal to 0? It's where x minus 3 times x minus 1 divided by x minus 5 times x plus 1 in the denominator. Where is this equal to 0? Where is the entire fraction equal to 0 means where is the numerator 0? So you have x minus 3 times x minus 1. Those two factors multiplied together give you 0. That means you have two different real zeros. It's where x minus 3 equals 0 or x minus 1 equals 0. So x equals 3 and x equals 1 are both real zeros for this rational function. So those two values will go on the sign chart or number line, x equals 1 and x equals 3. However, you also have for a rational function, what are the vertical asymptotes for the rational function? So notice what makes the denominator 0. That would make the entire function undefined. So x minus 5 times x plus 1, take the denominator and set it equal to 0, which means that x minus 5 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. So you get two values here as well. You get x equals 5 and x equals negative 1. These are two vertical asymptotes for your rational function r of x. So these will also go on the sign chart or number line. So we have x equals 1, x equals 3, x equals 5, and also x equals negative 1. That needs to go on the sign chart or number line. So you have negative 1, 1, 3, and 5. Make sure they're in numerical order from left to right on a sign chart or number line. Notice that this divides the number line or sign chart up into five different regions. x values less than negative 1, x values between negative 1 and 1, x values between x equals 1 and x equals 3, x values between 3 and 5, and x values that are greater than 5. You also have vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 1 and x equals 5, so let's denote those with dashed lines. So that way we know that we cannot include those x values as part of the solution because they don't produce output values for your rational function. Because those x values are not part of the domain of the rational function, they cannot be solutions to your rational inequality. However, x equals 1 and x equals 3, those were real zeros. So the graph can cross the x-axis at x equals 1 or x equals 3, or maybe the graph touches the x-axis and turns around at those x-intercepts. Let's find out what are some test values that we can choose. We'll choose x equals negative 2 on the left side of x equals negative 1, x equals 0 between negative 1 and 1, x equals 2 between 1 and 3, x equals 4 between 3 and 5, and x equals 6 for x values that are greater than 5. These test values go into the rational function r of x, which was x subtract 3 times x minus 1 in the numerator, divided by x minus 5 times x plus 1 also in the denominator. So if you substitute in x equals 6 on the right side, if you plug in 6, you'll get a positive y value of 15 sevenths. So on the right side of the graph, you'll be above the x-axis. On the right side of the vertical asymptote, x equals 5. 
Now, whenever x is equal to negative 2, if you plug that value into the rational function, the y value is also positive 15 sevenths. So on the left side of the graph, you'll be above the x-axis. So on the left side of the vertical asymptote, x equals negative 1, you're above the x-axis because the y value is positive. If you're between negative 1 and 1, let's plug in x equals 0, the y value is negative 3 fifths. So the y value is negative. Now you're below the x-axis on the right side of the vertical asymptote, x equals negative 1. If you substitute x equals 2 into the rational function, the y value is 1 ninth. The y value is positive. That means you're back above the x-axis on the other side of x equals 1. So you were below the x-axis on the left side of x equals 1, but now you're above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 1. You must have crossed the x-axis at x equals 1. So 1 comma 0 is an x-intercept, and you cross the x-axis at that point. And then the last test value that we'll plug in is x equals 4. If you plug that into the rational function r of x, the y value is negative 3 fifths. So the y value is a negative value again, so you're below the x-axis. So you're below the x-axis on the left side of the vertical asymptote, x equals 5, but then you're above the x-axis on the other side of x equals 5, on the right side. So you do change sign at the vertical asymptote, x equals negative 1, and also you change sign at x equals 5. So you do need to include vertical asymptotes when you consider sign changes for your rational function. So now we're ready to find out what is the solution to this rational inequality. The rational inequality was x subtract 3 times x minus 1 in the numerator, x minus 5 times x plus 1 in the denominator. Where is this rational function, r of x, less than or equal to 0? So we're looking for where is the graph below the x-axis or on the x-axis. So we're below the x-axis between negative 1 and 1. Notice you cannot include negative 1 because that's a vertical asymptote. So you have parentheses on negative 1. You do want to include x equals 1 because you're on the x-axis at x equals 1. So that is with a square bracket. Union, the other interval where we're below the x-axis is between 3 and 5. 3, we do want to include because that was an x-intercept or x equals 3 was a real 0. So bracket on 3 and up to 5, we're below the x-axis. But 5 cannot be included because, again, 5 is not part of the domain of the rational function. There's a vertical asset at x equals 5. So 5 is with a parenthesis. So the solution set to this inequality is parentheses negative 1, comma 1 with a square bracket on 1, union 3 with a square bracket on 3, comma 5, and 5 is with a parenthesis. So any x value that's in this solution set would solve the inequality x squared minus 4x plus 3 in the numerator divided by x squared minus 4x minus 5 in the denominator is less than or equal to 0. So this finishes our video on solving polynomial and rational inequalities. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about exponential functions.